All right, so next thing we're going to do is show you a bit of a soap opera. We got into the business of acting recently at our firm to try and show you in maybe a real life circumstance how things work when the first person passes away if you're a married couple. This skit is going to feature three actors. One is the attorney, which is our own Kanani Makaimoku. Many of you know her from attending seminars or she may be your um, attorney. She's going to be meeting with two people, the mother and the daughter. So the mother is Mary. You might remember Mary from the seminar that you've been to and her daughter Susan. So Mary is played by one of our former paralegals, Emily Foster, and Susan is played by Laureen Azama, who is the lead person that put this event on for you today. So we're gonna um, showcase what it's like when someone passes away. Sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not. And there are pitfalls that happen along the way. So we're just going to point some of those out so hopefully your family can avoid them. As you know, Sterling and Tucker offers a free meeting upon your death or incapacity. We're here to help your family at those difficult times. We know that it's a complicated situation for some families. It's overwhelming, it's upsetting, and we want you to feel comfortable that we're gonna be there to help your family. Are you okay for, are you ready for this meeting? I guess so. I guess it has to be done. Oh, can I? Mary. How are oh, you? How goodness. are you? Oh. I'm so I sorry to be seeing you under these circumstances. Me too. But I'm so glad you're helping us again. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to hear about Bill. I know it was unexpected. <laughs> it's just like that? Just gone? Just. Yeah, I know this is difficult, but what we're going to do is we're, we're going to get everything sorted out. So come with me. Okay, I'm going to go you. right down the hall. Here. Come, Susan. Okay, so when we last spoke on the phone, I know you were dealing with a lot of different things, and you were getting ready for the funeral. So how did that go? Oh, it went, it went okay. We, you know, we paid a lot of money for the casket, and a lot of money for a very nice funeral. And then we found out Bill had, through the military, he was supposed to be buried at Punch Bowl. Oh my goodness. So I, I didn't know that. I didn't know. Yeah, I did want to just draw your attention to this particular section in your binder. It's called the estate planning letter. We've got it right back here. And that's an area where you can indicate your wishes as to your funeral, your burial, oh, your cremation, okay. uh -huh. and perhaps if Bill had completed that, that would have been very helpful to you. Yes, it would have been. <laughs> yeah, but the good thing is you can still complete it for yourself, and that'll really help Susan to know what your wishes are when the time comes. I'll do that for you. I don't want you to go through with this. It's just horrible, it's just overwhelming. And did you folks by any chance bring the original trust documents and the asset and account information with you today? You know, Bill's office is such a mess. I, I can't. I don't know. I don't know what. I can't find anything. I know he had a bunch of different bank accounts, but I don't know the passwords. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how to get into the computer. So he handled the majority of those he, things. He did everything. Yeah. Things have changed over time. You know. With some of you were kids, they didn't have computers. Now everyone's got computers. Hell, I phone the computer. <laughs> so these days, a lot of people have a lot of their stuff on the internet, basically. You have email accounts. A lot of people don't, they have bank accounts on the internet. Not, you know, they don't bank with a, a, a place that has a location. Uh, brokerage accounts, E-Trade, all those places, they're all on the line only, right? That your family can't walk down to the bank and ask them what's going on. They may not even know you have an E-Trade account, right? 
because they don't you don't get mail from them. It's all emails, and they can't get an email account. <laughs> so there's two components to your digital assets. One, you want to make sure your family knows you have them and you know can get into them. So you, you do need to figure out a way to make sure they have a list of what you have, including email accounts and you know the passwords, how to get into them. Because all your e-trade accounts, all these other assets, they probably send you emails, so they need to get your email account, so that can be important too. The second side of this is legal. There's the you know the Computer Fraud Act. It, you get into kind of a gray area. Technically, if you violate a term of service of the provider, you know it's a federal offense. Many providers say you can't share your password. You can't you know let your someone else use your password. Your bank probably tells you that. Do they enforce it? Not normally. And I, personally, I can't guarantee you never get prosecuted with by the U.S. Attorney for Hawaii. But I don't see them prosecuting your son when you die. Or using your password to get into your email account to retrieve your financial information. You're not, you know, doing anything wrong, stealing or anything. It's a technical violation. You know, you have to decide how nervous that makes you. But, but the point is, he's going to have to get access to those things, and that's where all your information is. That, that, and that's about it. I guess the next step is show. Okay. So hopefully. Poor Mary can get access to Bill's accounts that are online and finds a way to do that. So it looks like you did bring some statements with you. Yeah, I found some, some statements about stocks and bonds, but they're like five years old. I don't know if we still have them or what's going on with them. Yeah, that's interesting that you mentioned that there are stocks and bonds that may be out there just in Bill's name. So what we need to determine is how much those stocks and bonds are valued at because if they total more than 100000 or if there are assets just in his name that total more than 100000 we're going to have to go through a probate proceeding, which means we'll also need to present the original will to the court to give you the authority to pour over those assets into the trust. So do you by chance have the original will? Oh, I thought everything was in our binder. This binder that you have here, these are copies of your documents. And we've got full sets of everything in here, but the originals were given to you in an envelope and it was stamped original. So perhaps you have that at home somewhere. I kind of remember bringing those envelopes home. But uh, again, we'll have to look for them. But what's this probate? I thought that's why we had a trust, so we didn't go through probate. Okay, Richard's going to come back up here and talk about probate. While he's getting up here, I want to reiterate that that binder you all have, that beautiful binder, is copies. That's a working copy for you. Your original should be in a manila envelope stamped original. You should be keeping that in a safe place where somebody knows where it is. Okay. <laughs> Many of you know that probate is something you want to avoid. It's a court process where you have a personal representative appointed and it's, it's designed deliberately to be kind of slow and annoying because it's to ensure that taxes get paid, creditors get paid, and a bunch of things get done. So to avoid probate, you know, we, we do urge you to put things in trust. Now, not everything actually goes in your trust. Some things you name beneficiaries for to avoid probate. Uh, but, you know, if we give you a letter when you sign your trust, it goes over all the different things you need to do. Probate is still something people want to avoid. We are, I would say, since I do all the probates in our office, that most of our clients don't go through probate. I mean, the vast majority of you don't. Most of the probates I do, more, I would say, are are clients who have family members who didn't take care of something and now they're in probate. Or sometimes it's new clients coming in who have existing issues. Like I have a client whose wife died some years ago and they didn't own the house where one dies, the other owns the house. So as part of doing his estate plan, we have to do a probate to get him and her half the house. <laughs> so, so the good news is you guys have been very good about putting things in trust and avoiding probate. And I am hoping that will continue on in the future. Okay, 
so hopefully Mary's probate goes relatively smoothly. Richard will help the family get through the probate process. Again, you, your trust can only control what's in it. So you need to make sure you're putting the proper things in your trust. Real estate, bank accounts, investment accounts that are not part of a retirement account probably should be titled in the name of your trust. So you need to make sure that you've done your funding of your trust. In your binder, there's a, a section that says funding instructions. You should read that. Like Richard mentioned, in the very front of your binder, there should be a letter that we prepared for you and sent you home with that gave you instructions on how to get things in your trust. Okay, back to our story. So I've been looking through the paperwork that you brought and I noticed that Bill also had a traditional IRA. Do you know who the beneficiary is on that account? Oh, I think the trust is the beneficiary. Well, I did get a peek at it, and it looked like it references a 1995 trust. Now, the interesting thing is this trust that we prepared is a 2008 trust. Do you know where that 1995 trust would have come from or where it is? We went to see a lawyer friend of his back then. He, uh, I don't remember. I don't remember okay. what it was. Yeah, uh, we're we're gonna have to figure that out because what is a little bit concerning is the fact that the trust is named as the beneficiary of a tax deferred IRA, and that is gonna cause some tax implications in terms of the distribution of that account to beneficiaries. So we will need to see that 1995 trust if you could go home and find it. as a beneficiary of a tax deferred account like an IRA. So even though we do hammer home to you that you have to put things in your trust, there are some things that naturally, probably for most people, shouldn't ever go into their trust. Okay, so Bill has named his trust as the beneficiary of his IRA. Now, why is that a problem? Okay, well, only an individual can be a designated beneficiary of an IRA. And his trust is not an individual. If there's no designated beneficiary, then this five-year rule applies. So the entire IRA needs to be distributed by the end of five in five years. Um, you don't have to take a distribution every year, but by the end of five years it has to be fully distributed. And this is the tax table for trust. So you can see that on the left side these are the taxable income brackets. They're very low and the tax rates move up very quickly so it doesn't take a lot of income to be paying a lot of tax at the trust level. Yeah, the IRS does have a you know, solution for this. This is the, they have what's called the look-through rule, where you look through the trust to the to the trust beneficiaries, and we try to get those trust beneficiaries as the designated beneficiaries of the IRA. Okay, but it, it does it's a little complicated, and there are a lot of requirements. Um, it has to be a valid trust under state law. It has to be irrevocable on death of the owner. Beneficiaries of the trust are, need to be identifiable in the trust instrument. And there needs to be required documentation, has to be provided to the IRA custodian or trustee. And this all has to be done by October of the year following the owner's death. So a lot of requirements. But if this look-through rule does apply, if you are able to meet those, then the IRA can be distributed over the life of the oldest beneficiary of the trust. Okay, and that's if if the own this is if you die before the beginning date, so before you're seventy and a half. If you the decedent died after the beginning date, then it's distributed over the longer of the life expectancy of the oldest trust beneficiary or the deceased owner's remaining life expectancy. So kind of complicated. <laughs> so what are some simpler alternatives? Well, you could name your spouse or a non-spouse, friend or family, um, you could name a charity. In our scenario, if Bill had named Mary as his beneficiary, then she could have rolled over the IRA to her own. She could have 
elected to treat the IRA and has their own IRA, you know, there's just a lot more flexibility. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Lori. So most of your trusts that were prepared by Sterling and Tucker would have these look-through provisions in them. But again, not a fun thing to have to go through to fight with the financial institutions and the IRS to get those look-through provisions enacted. So if you have a tax-deferred IRA, you need to check who your beneficiaries are and make sure it makes sense and that you've got the proper people named as the beneficiary. The other problem with the, this current scenario with Bill and Mary is Bill named a trust from 1995. Mary probably doesn't even know where that trust is and who knows what it says. So we need to make sure that if we have done prior estate planning documents that we're updating our beneficiary forms or making sure that those prior trusts are no longer in effect. Okay, back to our story. Okay, so it also looks like, when I go through this paperwork here, that your residence and your bank accounts were in the name of your 2008 trust. Uh-huh, right, right. Do you know if you ever made any changes to that trust after you came to see us the first time? We were, yeah, we were thinking about it, but no, we, we didn't ever do anything about it. No, we were, we were happy with the, the way it was. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is take a look at what that trust actually says. And I'm going to take a peek here because we need to know what's supposed to happen upon the death of the first spouse. And when I look at it here, I'm seeing that your trust requires a split into two subtrust upon that first death. So that does mean that at this point we're going to have to create what's called a survivor's trust and a family trust. What does that mean? That trust became irrevocable when Bill passed away. Mary is still the trustee as long as she's capable of doing so. She's usually entitled to the income that would be flowing off of the assets in that trust but she has limited access to the principal. We call it health, maintenance, support, education. In exchange for that limited access, that money in that B trust, that family trust, grows estate tax free. So the idea was really to preserve each person's estate tax exemption amount and get some estate tax free growth. But as Lori talked about earlier this morning, the amount you can pass estate tax free now is what? 11.2 million. So whether or not this structure is still necessary for most of us, I'm not so sure. But Bill and Mary did not get their estate plan reviewed, and now we're stuck with what it currently says. So we're gonna to have to create an A trust and a B trust. That B trust is gonna to have to file its own tax return. So Lori's gonna talk about the difficulties of that. Okay, so with this B trust, the family trust that Michelle mentioned, it may need to file a tax return. This is the tax form for, for trust. It's, well, it's the first page of the tax, report, tax form. There are a lot more pages. Um, and the income threshold to require filing a, tax, a trust tax return is very low. It's only $600 of income before you have to file the return. So, and again, this is the slide I had up earlier. These are the tax rates for a trust, and they are, you know, same as individuals, but they move up really fast. So look at this tax bracket. It doesn't take a lot of income to maintain the highest bracket. Okay, now Kanani's going to come talk to us on how we can avoid having a family trust created and having to prepare those tax returns and possibly pay that higher tax bracket. Good morning. So you heard a lot recently about the big change in the income tax, or well, the income taxes, of course, but also the federal estate tax exemption having changed drastically over the last several years, and definitely this year when it doubled. 
And so before 2001, as Michelle alluded to, it was a relatively straightforward job when we had a married couple setting up a trust. And the intention was that the survivor's trust and the family trust would both be created upon the death of the first spouse. But now that we have such a high threshold, we realize that that sort of extra paperwork, that separate income tax filing, is really not something most people want to have to deal with unless there's some benefit to them. And so you can see that schedule and how it's really changed over the years. And that survivor's trust and family trust would have to be created. But now we've got another option, and we call it the disclaimer trust. So this is a great flexible option that allows the surviving spouse the option to have everything funnel in to a survivor's trust rather than require this split into the two subtrusts. And the key there is that the survivor's trust would be under the full control and authority of the surviving spouse and also there's no need for a separate tax filing. Now this disclaimer trust option is in a lot of our clients, our married couple clients trust, but if you're Unsure if you have this sort of provision, you should schedule a review of your trust to make sure that you've updated everything, as well as the other things that may be outdated at this point. And again, if your trust is from way back when, in the 90s, early 2000s, you likely do not have this disclaimer trust option. And what that would mean is the split does need to occur, the family trust and the survivor's trust upon the first death. If you'd like to simplify, we suggest that you do that make it much easier for the surviving spouse, and it also gives you the flexibility to split the trust into the family trust and survivor's trust if there is a tax reason for doing so in that particular year. And we don't know what the future holds, so we want to have the most flexible provisions for everyone. And again, it, we suggest you just come in and review everything, make sure everything's in order. We don't expect that you'll automatically remember all of this when your spouse passes away. There's a lot of different things you're dealing with at that time. However, we'll be here to help you make a decision as to what sort of structure fits your situation best. And for most of us, it's gonna be this one survivor's trust using the disclaimer trust option. Great, thanks. So unfortunately, Bill and Mary didn't come in for a trust review, didn't get their documents updated. So they're gonna have an A trust and a B trust, that means Mary's going to have to split bank accounts half into the A trust, half into the B trust. She's going to have that hassle. So hopefully your family will avoid that. If you're concerned about this, like Tanani said, you can come in. You can also give us a call and we can probably look it up um, on our system. Your, your um, state planning documents have been scanned in and saved in a PDF format that we can look at and remind you or let you know if you have that disclaimer planning. Okay, back to our story. So, so do you know who prepares your tax returns? Uh, I don't know the guy's name. Again, it was a friend of Bill's. And he'd take the paperwork to the guy, and then mm -hmm. he'd bring the tax returns home, and I'd sign them. Okay. I don't know. Well, I don't want you to worry about that, because we do have CPAs here at our firm and our CPAs can help you with your personal income tax return. They can also help you with the family trust return, uh -huh. but we will need to get our hands on that prior tax return or returns okay. so that we know what's going on and yeah. have a full yeah. picture. Yeah. This is so overwhelming. Don't worry, Mom. I'll help you out. Oh, thank you. Are you okay with going through what you have at home and having someone come to organize it for you? Well, I don't want to get rid of everything. There's some things I want to keep. Yeah, you know, just sitting here listening to what you have to say about Bill's office and the way uh -huh. that things were kept, I know that you probably wouldn't want to leave that sort of a, an issue for your daughter, for your kids. And so I would recommend really paring down everything consolidating those bank accounts uh -huh. and the other assets so that it's really simple to deal with. And one suggestion I have, if you're open to it, is you could meet with Michelle Tucker at 3D Wealth Management and get some oh. financial planning advice. Wow. Oh, that's wonderful. Will you come with me to that meeting? Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Now, what do you think about having a co-trustee 
to help you manage the trust and the assets in the trust? Well, yeah, Bill and I were co-trustees, so who would be the trustee? Well, the way that your trust is set up right now, it calls for Susan to step in if you're able, unable to handle things. So we oh, could consider okay. having Susan step up next to you the way Bill was. And yeah, she yeah. can help you with and those. Yeah, and then, okay, okay, then she can, if anything happens to me, she can just step in. Exactly. Oh, okay. So okay. I know this is a lot to absorb today, So, and we've talked about a lot of different things. What I'm going to do is jot down some items for you as to oh, what to, thank you. What to yes. do and what to bring with you the next time. Okay. The first document I'm going to ask you to find is the original last will for Bill. We're going to need that for the probate proceeding. Okay. See, I'm also going to ask you to look for any prior tax returns that you may be able to get your hands on. Okay. Perhaps you can get a clue in looking through some of the paperwork and find that accountant's name and okay. get a hold of the information from him or her. Okay. okay. All right. And lastly, I'm going to ask you to look high and low for that 1995 trust because that's the trust that's designated uh -huh. to receive that IRA and we really need to know what it says since it's a tax deferred account okay. and it may cause some complications. Okay. okay. So if you could go home and find that last will, the tax returns, the 1995 trust, and I'm also going to add here any bank statements or other account information that you may come across. Uh -huh. We really would appreciate seeing all of those documents and information so we can figure out exactly what needs to be done and we can take care of everything for you. Oh, that's wonderful. I just, I don't know what to do. It's just overwhelming. It really is, but yeah. we'll help you. We'll be here and we'll check back in in about six weeks okay. for you folks to come back and sign everything. Okay, okay. Thank okay, you. Okay, so Michelle Tecker's going to come up and talk about how she sometimes helps the surviving spouse after the first one has passed. But again, you're seeing the theme here, right? We want you to leave a legacy, not a mess, for your family. And we also are there to help you. We're there to help you um, if your loved one passes before you. And we're here, here to help make sure that things can go as easily as possible, such as bringing a child or somebody on as a co-trustee after the first step. Here's Michelle. This uh, slide is a handout in your materials, and it lists most of the relevant aspects of your financial life that you need to consider. But Mary is bewildered and grieving and probably has no interest in talking about her finances, and yet there are some important matters that need her to attend to. And so what, what the goal of this meeting is, is to help Mary become a little less bewildered and give her enough information that she can go through all the steps that she is going to have to go through. You listen to the um, video and can tell she's got a lot of work ahead of her. So one of the first things she has to do is come up with a complete list of all the assets that the family owns. And it doesn't have to be a fancy list. And um, she can get help, but she should do a lot of this work herself because now the family finances is her responsibility, and so she should know what she has. So let's fast forward and assume that she and uh, Susan are able to come up with this list, which is a little small, but it's in your um, materials, and it's the financial asset assets that leave a lot of work for survivors to do. Okay, so. She has bank accounts, she has three bank accounts, three CDs, four IRAs, one 401k, a tax deferred annuity, some savings bonds, a brokerage account, and some penny stock that's worthless, all right? So uh, now that we know what she has, now what we have to do is sit down with Mary, and this is going to take two to three hours, and we go through all the stuff that she has slowly so that she can follow along. And we're going to make a list of everything she has to do. And so what she has to do for the bank accounts, she has to choose which one she's going to keep. We're, we're, we're encouraging her to simplify. So choose which one she wants to keep. 
She has to identify where direct deposits are going and where automatic payments are coming from so she doesn't mess with those accounts without making arrangements. She has to change the social security on all the accounts because it's probably Bill's social security number and it's got to be Mary's now. She has to keep a, one account open with Bill's name so that if checks come in, she has a place to deposit them. She has to create that joint account with Susan, like Kanani suggested, so that Susan can help. And for the CDs, she has to figure out if she does anything with them now, what happens? Is there an early withdrawal penalty? For the IRAs, she has to make sure Bill took the required minimum distribution, and there are four. She has to consolidate the IRA accounts. She has to figure out where she wants her accounts to be. She has to open a new spousal IRA, and after she's got that open, she needs to fill out all the paperwork to get the four IRAs that Bill owns into her own IRA. And then she has to, that trust that's the beneficiary of one of her IRAs, she has to figure out how bad the consequences are going to be, the tax consequences, and figure out if she can fix that, get the custodians to cooperate, and she'd have to do that again four times because they have four IRAs. For the 401k, she has to contact human resources, disclose the death of Bill. She has to request forms to fill out, and she has to make choices. And what choices she makes, then she has to, of course, implement them. Probably she'll decide to roll the 401k into her IRA. For the stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, all those get stepped up to value at date of death. So she has to contact the custodian, make sure the custodian increases the value of the stocks to date of death value. She has to probably establish a relationship with somebody who can give her some pointers because she's not as fond of finances as Bill was. Again, change the social security number on the account. For the bonds, savings bonds, easy asset. Are they still earning interest? Government doesn't let you know that they've matured and they're not earning interest. So she, let's say she wants to just cash them in. Well, there's a lot of tax deferred interest. Too much of that has negative tax consequences. She needs to maybe reissue them in her own name because it was Bill and Susan. And now it should be, I mean, Bill and Mary, it maybe should be her and Susan had a designated beneficiary for the death on the tax deferred annuity. This is a non qualified tax deferred annuity. She has to contact the institution, ask for the claim forms, figure out which option she wants, and execute. Okay? All right? <laughs> right. So, yeah, I know I went through that really fast, and, and you see, I'm not trying to get you to memorize all the stuff that your survivors are going to have to do. I'm trying to get you to simplify, okay? So, even if you try to simplify, Mary's still got a lot of work to do. If you don't simplify, Mary's going to be dazed and confused. So, as much as possible, Review your financial picture and simplify as much as possible. Consolidate your accounts and simplify your portfolio so you can kind of explain it to Mary. This is what I'm doing. This is what you should continue to do. Investigate, investigate what Mary's going to have to do and prepare her for that. Choose a financial advisor that she should work with if you have one. If there are complicated decisions that she's going to have to make, figure out what those are work through them yourself and tell her, you know, if it's me that goes first, this is what I'd recommend you do. If you're really thorough, get the form she's going to have to fill out. If this is the one for savings bonds, just page one. There are five pages for, you know, decedents who are inheriting savings bonds. It's five pages because there are like ten different choices. She's not going to know what to do, right? So figure out how she should fill out those forms, okay? Now what we're going to do, as I say, spend a couple of hours sitting down making sure that she knows what to do and hopefully Susan will help her get all that done so that Mary will have financial peace of life, peace of mind for the rest of her life. Thank you, Michelle. I have personally seen the benefit of Michelle helping um, a surviving spouse go through this very difficult time. So she's an amazing person and really also caring and compassionate and can help. But again, if you can simplify things and consolidate 
before you go, it's going to make life a lot easier on those that are left behind. Okay, so back to our story. Susan, I'm so sorry to hear about your mom's passing. She was a very nice lady and I enjoyed getting to know her and getting to work with her. Thank you. We're so happy that you're here to help us. No problem. So how did the funeral go? The funeral went really well. It went smoothly. You know, mom had everything prepaid and arranged, so it went really smoothly. Good. I'm glad to hear that. So at this point, now that mom has passed, you're the remaining trustee. You recall we had you come on board as a co-trustee along with her several years ago. Yeah. So did you bring any bank statements or account information with you? Yes. Thankfully, Mom consolidated things and had everything organized. Um, There's a few accounts that I have to deal with that I'm named as um, trustee. And Michelle Tucker from 3D Wealth uh, helped us get all the accounts organized. My brother and I are named as beneficiaries for the IRA and the uh, insurance policies. And the CPAs at Sterling and Tucker have been working with my mom since dad had passed away. Great. So we have everything organized. So I'm meeting with them today as well. Great. I'm so glad. It sounds like you folks really took to heart getting everything organized, decluttering, getting rid of all the unnecessary things to make it a lot easier. Yes. So how did things go with her household goods and the personal belongings? Well, we helped mom clean the house and um, after dad had passed away, so there isn't much mm -hmm. to um, take care of there. Okay. And uh, she gave away a lot of the things that she didn't need anymore, and we made a list of where she wanted other things to go. Great. So it sounds like at this point, it's going to be pretty simple to administer your mother's trust. We're going to go ahead and figure out the remaining bills after the funeral expenses have been paid, those medical bills, any other debt that she may have, then we can go ahead and get the house transferred out to you and your brother. And Michelle Tucker can help you to get those other accounts and assets transferred over th to the two of you. Okay, thank you so much. We, um, Really happy that mom came, mom and I came here after dad passed away to get things organized and just simplify things in her life. Yeah. No it's problem. much less stress. Great. We're so happy you folks did come to us. And, you know, this really is a time that we're happy to, to help and to assist through this difficult process. Thank you. Okay. So happy ending to the story, right? You know, they took all our advice, got things simplified, organized, got rid of all the extra stuff that they didn't need around the house, consolidated bank accounts, got with a good financial planner got the proper beneficiaries named on the IRAs, and things went relatively smoothly on the second death when Mary passed away. So we encourage you to do that. We're gonna take a little break in a couple of minutes here. There are going to be some light refreshments out there for you. The restrooms, like I said, are out the back door to your right if you need to use the restroom. When we come back, we're going to have a wonderful guest speaker, Heather Hooper, talk to us about redefining your entire your retirement. In the meantime, you can stroll around and visit the booths in the back. Again, the social media booth is going to help you understand how to leave a review on social media and to use our website. There's a seminar and appointments booth. If you would like to come in and see us to have your documents reviewed, please sign up for an appointment. Again, you'll receive a 10% discount on any work that we do by attending the seminar today. There is the trust administration booth, which gives you some information, much like what we talked about up here earlier. The tax planning booth, if you want to talk to the CPAs about any tax concerns you have, and the retirement planning booth is there as well. If you have questions, feel free to approach the attorneys during the breaks. If um, we have enough time at the very end today, we'll open it up to question and answers. So thank you, and we have a 